Okay, so uh, I'm Tom Stellard. Uh, I'm a developer at AMD uh, in the Embedded Solutions division, uh, and I work on our open source GPU drivers. Uh, my primary focus is OpenCL, uh, and I also work on the shader compiler for our OpenGL drivers. So today I'm going to talk to you about the R600 backend, which is something I've been working on for, I think, two years now, and it's been in tree for, for about one year. So I'm just going to start out, give a brief overview, what is the backend, how do we use it, that kind of stuff. Uh, then I'll give a brief introduction to GPU architectures and specifically uh, our, the GPUs we have at AMD. Uh, then we'll take a look at some of the features and sort of the interesting quirks of the back end. Uh, I don't really have time to cover everything, so I just sort of picked out the most interesting parts that I, I think might, might be interesting to the most people. Uh, then at the end, I'll talk about some future work, some kind of hopes that, and things I would like to work on if I had extra time and things that I, I may be working on uh, in the future. Okay, so first of all, what is the R600 backend? Well, it's just one component of AMD's open source GPU drivers. So we provide uh, open source GPU drivers uh, for Linux and, and other operating systems uh, that have implementations of several popular APIs. So OpenGL, OpenCL, uh, VD, VDPAU. Um, and our drivers are a collaborative effort between AMD and the open source community. So we actually get a lot of contributions from the community. Uh, and the community is made up of other companies like Red Hat, but also a lot of independent contributors. So for the, for the back end, what, the things we use it for right now are GLSL shaders for OpenGL and also OpenCLC programs. And one thing that a lot of people get confused about when they hear about uh, an, a an LLVM backend from AMD, they think it's the AMD IL backend. So I just wanted to clarify, R600 and AMD IL are completely separate backends. Um, AMD IL backend is used by our proprietary OpenCL driver, uh, and it actually emits a low-level assembly and, and not actual machine code. So why do we call it the R600? Uh, again, this is a little bit of confusion. People see that and they say, oh, that's really old. Like, Why are you still working on a compiler for that? Uh, but the reality is, in, in open source, we, we tend to name things after the first generation that they support. So in this case, the oldest generation support is R600, so that's what we called it. And really, the other reason is Chris asked me to name it that before I committed it, so it kind of had some influence, too. Um, but anyway, so and at AMD for open source drivers, why did we choose LLVM? Well, there's, there's lots of reasons, uh, but just two really important ones for us um, is it, it really reduces our development time. Uh, we have kind of a small open source team, so any sort of advantage we can get to speed things up and get something working faster, uh, you know, we really like to take advantage of that kind of stuff. Uh, and the other thing we really like is the testing coverage it gives us. You know, LLVM and Clang are used in lots of different domains by lots of different people. It, it really um, gives a different uh, optimization algorithms, you know, like a really good testing. So we, so we like to have sort of that assurance that the stuff we're using is, is being well tested, and it's, it's certainly more testing that, that we could do on our, on our own. Okay, so just in case, just for people who aren't, maybe aren't familiar with GPU architecture, just give sort of a, a high-level overview. Uh, first, let's start with some terms that I'll be using in the talk. Uh, un unfortunately, uh, different APIs and, and different vendors tend to use different terms to represent the same thing, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna try and stick to these terms in the talk and ho hopefully to make things as simple as possible. Um, so one, th one thing, uh, when I talk about a thread, I'm talking about a single element of execution. Uh, you can think, if you're familiar with OpenCL, like one work item. Um, the, the other term I'll use is wave, which is a group of threads that are executed concurrently on the hardware. We also have an execution unit, which is basically equivalent to a CPU core. That, that's the, how you can kind of picture that. And then compute units are a collection of execution units that, that may share some kind of resources. Uh, and then when I talk about vectors, I'll talk about vector components. Uh, a lot of people maybe are more familiar with the term vector lane, uh, but so I, if I say four component vector, that's a, a vec4. Uh, and also, uh, when I, we usually use letters to label the components, and you, you'll notice the alphabet is sort of in the wrong order. Uh, that, that's not a misprint, that's just sort of the, the convention for GPUs, so we, I, we, we call them X, Y, Z, W. So as far as the actual architecture of GPUs, it, GPUs are a collection of hundreds or even thousands of these individual execution units. Uh, and the units are grouped together into compute units, which, like I said before, they share resources uh, with each other and, and are sort of a, a distinct unit that, and that can be 
added or removed to different chips. So different chips have different number of, of compute units. Uh, the, other, the other kind of thing to know about GPUs is the control flow is a little different than on CPUs. So all threads in a wave share a program counter, so it's, it's not always possible to do real branching. For example, if you have 64 threads in a wave and half of them want to take the true branch and half of them want to take the false branch, you can't do, any, you can't do anything with a program counter. You have to execute all the threads. So how that's implemented is there's an execution mask, so any thread that doesn't want to take the jump, it just gets masked and all of its results are ignored. Okay, so looking specifically at AMD GPUs, uh, there are two different architectures that are supported by the R600 backend. Uh, the first architecture is our older VLIW architecture, uh, and then the more recent one is what we call Graphics Core ne Next, uh, and that's for Southern Islands uh, GPUs and newer. And newer. Uh, then when he, within each architecture, there are different what we call GPU generations. So for VLIW, there's four generations, R600, R700, Evergreen, Northern Islands, and then Cayman. And then for GCN, there's, there's two, uh, Southern Islands and Sea Islands. So for generations with the same architecture, the, the ISA is about 95% the same, uh, but it's not compatible b between these generations. Uh, so, so every time a new one comes out, we have to update the compiler and, and make sure that, that it will it'll work with the newest generation. And then again, within each generation, there are several variants. Uh, between the variants, the ISA is compatible, but the different variants may have different resources. So kinda, it's something you have to be aware of when you're writing a compiler, but it doesn't really f affect the correctness of, of the code that you generate. OK, so now we'll just take a look um, a little deeper at, at some of the specifics of our VLIW chips. Uh, so I, I have on up here just an example program. It's pretty simple. Uh, it's an OpenCL kernel where it takes two arguments and then adds them together and then writes them out to global memory. Uh, so the way these programs are structured, there's, there's sort of two different levels of instructions. There are the high level instructions, uh, which we call control flow instructions, and then also the lower level ALU instructions. So the control flow instructions handle pro program flow like you might imagine, uh, but they're also used for doing other things like writing data to global memory. Uh, and actually, the most important thing you use for it is initiating a clause. So a clause is a group of lower level instructions. This can be a group of ALU instructions, a group of vertex fetch instructions, or a group of texture fetch instructions. And each clause has some kind of limit to the number of instructions that can be included. So if you have a really long program that's all ALU instructions, you can't put it all in one clause. You have to break it up into multiple clauses uh, so this is something that you know, presents a little bit of a challenge when, when we're trying to, to do optimal scheduling for this hardware. So if you look at the example program, we'll just walk through really quick. So the very first instruction at the top uh, begins an ALU clause. So that's a, the first one is a control flow instruction. So what that does is it says, OK, take the ALU instructions at address 4 and execute those. And then when it's done, it moves on to the next control flow instruction, which is the the cacheless store raw, which is a write to global memory, and then the next control flow is, is end, which tells it to end the program. So it's a little different structure than, than maybe most people are familiar with with, with a CPU, where there's, there's kind of different levels, if you will, of, of instructions. So looking at the actual ALUs, the actual execution units, um, they can be four or five wide, depending on the variant, uh, and they can execute four or five different instructions at once. So it's not, it's not like a vector unit where all the instructions are the same. You, you can put whatever instructions you want with, with, some, with some limits. Um, the LUs have access to 128 uh, vector registers. So each register has four components of 32 bits. And within the VLIW packet, the the instruction in the X slot of the packet can only write to X components of registers. The instruction in the Y slot can only write to the Y component, et cetera. So this is just another constraint we sort of have to deal with. Uh, and then the, the fifth slot, if it's available, can write to any component. Okay. As far as inputs and outputs on the instructions, um, there's really a lot of different inputs. Uh, each inst instruction uh, can take 
a 32-bit literal constant as its input. Uh, it can also read from what are called the previous registers. And what those are is it's the result from the previous VLIW packet. So if, if you have your previous packet computes some result, you want to use it, you can just read from the previous register. Don't even have to go through uh, the, the temporary registers at all. So the, the more common inputs are the temporary registers. Um, so instructions usually just read from one component of the register. Um, when writing, there's no data dependency between components of the same vector. So you can have all you know, four instructions in the packet, each write to a different component of the same register, and that's okay. The, the, those, there's no, no problem with that. The other kind of input uh, are what we call constant registers. Uh, and these are used to access values that are in the constant memory cache. So this is for uniforms, if, if you're familiar with, with OpenGL. Uh, and so how this works is uh, the control flow instructions that begin an ALU clause, they will load certain values into the cache. And then those values will be available in the clause. So this is another sort of challenge in scheduling where you have to sort of know what values will be used by the clause when it starts. Uh, so this is another thing we sort of have to to deal with. Okay. Another issue uh, are the source restrictions on the VLIW packets. There are a lot of ins uh, restrictions on what uh, combinations of operands and registers you can read from in a single packet. Uh, I could probably do an entire talk just on those restrictions, but I'll, I'll just focus on the most common one, uh, which uh, deals with the temporary registers. So for each instruction, for each packet actually, the loading of the inputs uh, happens over three cycles. So in each cycle, you're allowed to read a register from one, one register with an X component, one register with a Y component, one register with a Z component, et cetera. Uh, and then you can feed those onto whatever instruction or whatever um, operand you need to. So this presents a lot of complication, especially since you, when you're writing the compiler, you, just, you have to be aware of all these restrictions, and you have to have to tell the GPU how, when to fetch the operands, uh, which cycle to fetch, fetch them on. Uh, so it, it sort of makes things a little complicated. Okay, so the other architecture that we support in the R600 backend is uh, Graphics Core Next. Uh, this is really a completely different architecture, but there's enough similarities in it where we, we actually can share a lot of code with the older VLIW chips. Um, the, the kind of the main differences are uh, for GCN, there are actually two different kinds of ALUs, uh, the scalar ALU and the vector ALU. Uh, and note, I, I use capital letters for these. These are what they're called, not necessarily the kind of data they operate on. So I'll talk more about that in, in a minute. So essentially the control flow instructions have, have now been emplaced by a single scalar ALU, uh, which, which handles control flow and, and other stuff like that. And the other kind of main difference is all the vector registers are gone. So we're back to using just regular scalar registers, 32-bit. And the other difference is, as I talked about before, branching is implemented using execution max. And on the older VLIW chips, that was handled for us in the hardware. So we would just execute a control flow instruction. It would update the mask and then push or pop it off of a stack depending on the, the depth of the branch. But now we have to do that all manually um, with GCN. So as I said before, two ALU types, the scalar ALU. Um, so there's one, generally one of these per wave. So one scalar ALU might, might, drive, might be used, might be shared among 64 threat, different threads. Uh, it's responsible for control flow. Uh, there's a limited instruction set. Basically, it's just integer operations uh, and then some instructions for branching. And it has 102 32-bit registers, which are called the scalar registers. So the ALU type is the vector ALU. Um, so the vector ALU actually executes scalar instructions. The reason it's called vector is because there's 64 vector ALUs um, that are grouped together with one scalar ALU. So that's, that's sort of where the, the vector is, is from those 64 units. Um, when you're writing a compiler for these, 
Um, you really don't need to be aware that there are 64. Really, from the, the compiler's point of view, there are just two ALUs, one scalar and one vector. And you can intermix these instructions um, any way that you want. And they're always executed in sequence regardless of the ALU type. So the vector ALU can read data from the scalar registers. But copying data from vector registers into scalar is not always possible. So there's kind of a one-way flow of data. So the scalar, scalar ALU will load some data, and then it's available to the vector ALU. But the vector ALU is unable to send data. Well, it can, but for the most part, it can't really send data back to the, to the scalar ALU. So this is so another little quirk of the architecture. So another big difference is we now have variable pointer sizes uh, in GCN. So uh, we use 64-bit pointers for global and constant memory, uh, and then 32-bit pointers for local memory. Uh, and 128-bit, 256, 512-bit resource descriptors for texture and buffer instructions. Uh, these aren't really pointers, but they kind of act like pointers in the instructions. Uh, so we, we, it's something that we'll, we may have to, to deal with uh, if we start using real pointers for those in, in the future. Well, you can see from the sample program, you know, the very first instruction uh, is, a, is a load from constant memory, and it, it uses two, a pair of 32-bit GPRs for the pointer, so the pointer is 64-bit. And then the second to last instruction, which we're storing a, a buffer to global memory, uh, uses four consecutive GPRs, so it has a 128-bit resource descriptor that, that it's using. So there's some differences. And this, this has been one thing that has been a little bit of a challenge getting it integrated with LVM, but uh, luckily Matt's been doing some good work on that to, to kind of make things work. So it's been working out pretty, pretty well for us so far. OK, so now I've, I've sort of given sort of a, a quick crash course in the different architectures. And, and I'm going to really talk about some of the, the LVM-specific stuff that I, we've had to deal with with working on this, this back end. And so the first thing I want to talk about is the instruction operands that, that we use. So for our VLIW chips, here's an example of all the operands we have for a floating point add instruction. So in a typical architecture, there might, you, know, you might have your source register 0, source register run. But on the GPU, there's tons and tons of operands for each instruction. So most of these operands are actually just configuration bits for the instruction. So we have modifiers that you can apply to inputs and outputs. For example, you can set a bit, and the hardware will take the absolute value of one of the source registers before feeding it into the instruction. Uh, you can do the same thing with taking the negation of an operand. And then the outputs, you can uh, clamp the output between 0 and 1 before you write it to a register. Uh, or you can uh, use the output modifier, which allows you to multiply the output by uh, a floating point power of 2 uh, before writing it to the register. Um, so n really not many. You can multiply it by a half, 2, and 4, and that's, that's pretty much it. So it's not, not a very w wide range of numbers, but it's, it still allows you to do some, some kind of neat optimizations. So other uh, bit configuration bits that exist on, on the instructions are predicate bits to predicate instructions that, that you don't want to execute. And also some indirect addressing bits, which, which we'll talk about later. But these let you sort of treat the register file as if it were memory and, and dynamically index into it. So all these in instruction operands have, have presented some problems for us when, when we're working on the back end. Um, particularly, how do we figure out how to select instructions that have so many operands? Typically, the well, for floating point add, for example, in the selection DAG node, it only has two inputs. So we have an instruction with all these inputs. How, how, do we, how do we match that, and how do we make that work? So the solution we have now is a special operand class, uh, which lets us specify a default value for an operand. So we can use this for all our configuration registers. And so we can define the operands as taking a default value. In most cases, it's 0. And this will tell table gen that when it's trying to match pat when it's trying to generate code to match patterns, it should instead of trying to match these operands, just initialize their value to whatever the default value is. So this is this allows us to write a really simple pattern like we have for our 24-bit multiply, where all we have to do is you know specify the, the two operands that match the 
DAG node and it works just fine. And all the other operands are initialized to their correct default value. The other issue we have is how can we efficiently set the absolute value and negation modifiers that we have on our inputs? We want to be able to, and ideally, we would be able to just write some sort of table gem pattern. It would match it, and it would be able to set all of the, the correct bits for us. So one way to implement this would be using the complex patterns. Um, so how this works is they, they take a node as an input and allow you to uh, output multiple nodes. So this would be a great solution for us because we could take the input, and if it was uh, a, a, the opcode was absolute value, then we could set the absolute value bit and pass its operand onto the, the register output value and, and, or do the same thing for negation. So, so that would be really easy and, and, and not a lot of code. But fortunately, doing this sort of breaks the instruction encoding. Uh, we have a really nice feature in table gen where uh, if you define your instruction encoding fields with the same name as the instruction operands, it will automatically uh, know which field to use when it's encoding those operands. So this is something that, that doesn't work if you're using these complex patterns and uh, the special operands which take one operand and map it to, to three machine operands. So this isn't, isn't really a, a good solution for us. Uh, the other problem is it doesn't really work well with the standalone patterns. Uh, I, haven't, I wasn't able to find a way to write the standalone patterns that use these complex patterns and, and actually have it work correctly. So. If anyone's been able to do this, please contact me after the talk or something, and you can, you can show me how. But we ran into a lot of problems doing this. So we ended up falling back on sort of a brute force approach uh, where we just post process the DAG, and we fold our absolute values, and we fold our negations right into the operand. And you know that, that sort of gives us what we want, even though we end up duplicating a lot of things that TableGen could, could probably be doing for us. Okay, so another issue with having all these operands is how do we access them uh, from our machine instruction passes? So we, we have all these configuration bits, we want to set them, we maybe want to check their value, uh, but they might have a different machine instruction index depending on the opcode. So it's really difficult to, to be able to, to just generically say, I want to set the absolute value bit on the first source operand of this instruction. That there's really no good way to do that. So the solution that we're using for that uh, is a special bit you can set on the table gen instruction definitions called use named operand table. Uh, and what this will do is we'll generate a function which lets you actually query the index of an operand based on the opcode and then the, an enumeration that uses the names defined uh, in the, the table gen instruction definitions. So now if we want to set the absolute value bit uh, on source zero, for example, we have this really nice function we can use um, to, to get the correct index, set the value, and you know, it works pretty well. This is one thing I, I think might be useful in, in general um, for, for any target, because uh, it's sort of nice and it makes the code a little easier to read you know, if you can specify and, and choose an operand based on its name rather than just sort of a random index number. Okay, so another big challenge uh, with the GPUs is indirect addressing. So what this is, uh, is it, it allows instruct, ALU instructions to dynamically index into the register file. So what you can do in this example add instruction is you can say, okay, I want the first operand to be the value in temporary register three plus some dynamic value that I've calculated some other way. So this is typically used for accessing arrays that are stored in registers, um, and tends to make optimization really difficult. Uh, if you have an instruction that could potentially read or write any register, you can't really do a lot of optimizations on that. So we have to come up with some sort of solution. So the first solution I came up with was, was really complicated, and I ended up throwing it out. But the basic idea was to assign virtual registers to arrays, uh, and then try and track which instructions might access the arrays using implicit uses and defs, um, and then eventually you just use a reg sequence instructions to sort of fit those arrays into consecutive registers. It, it turns out, even though the code was optimized, it was really difficult 
very complicated, so I ended up throwing it out. Um, whoops. Uh, and so I moved on to another solution, uh, which was basically to reserve a block of the general purpose registers as sort of a register address space. And then we have sp special loads and stores uh, for this address space that we, we use. And then we lower those stores to the, the correct ALU instructions after register allocations. So the advantage of doing this is it was kind of easy to implement, um, actually really easy to implement, but the disadvantage is it produces really inefficient code. So basically any array that you have in your program, you have to reserve those registers and those can't be used at all in the program. So now you've in increased your register count uh, and that really hurts performance a lot. So the best solution um, and something that I, I would like to try and, and use for OpenCL is to model arrays using vectors. So rather than having an alloca and then loading and storing values from the array, uh, what you would do is you just have a vector that represents the array and then you would use the insert and extract element uh, to access the values. So this would be really nice. It, it would allow us to generate optimized code uh, because uh, LLVM is, is already really good at fitting the vector registers or it actually, it, it, I should say, it knows how to put the vectors in consecutive registers, so that's, that kind of solves a, a lot of our problems, and, and it would be a really nice solution for OpenCL. Uh, and it's actually something we, we use for GLSL shaders for our GCN hardware, and, and it works pretty well. Uh, the only problem is if you know, we would want to create huge vectors, for example, like 128 element vectors, and that's something that TableGen doesn't really support right now, so there's, there's kind of a lot of work that would need to happen to make it work as a more general solution, but it, it's something that we're, we're definitely interested in. So another sort of tricky issue that we've run into, as I mentioned before, is the instruction selection with the multiple ALU types. Uh, these two ALUs have different but overlapping instruction sets, and the data can only flow one way. So once you push data on from the scalar ALU to the vector ALU, you, you can't get it back. So we need to, to come up with some solution to tell the instruction selector pass which instructions to use. Now it would be best if we could have the instruction selector automatically infer which type to use based on some sort of analysis of the, the flow of data, but it doesn't really, there's not really a good way to do that in, in the current uh, instruction selector. So what, what we do instead is we just write a table gem pattern, we select to the scalar ALU, and then we have a machine instruction pass later on that goes through and moves things to the vector ALU if, if it's needed. Okay, so one last thing, one last sort of back-end related thing, uh, scheduling for R600, which in this case refers to our VLIW chips. So scheduling is really complicated because as I mentioned before, we have all those source restrictions and also there are the different kinds of clauses. So you have to sort of decide when, you know, how many instructions you want to put in your ALU clause before you start a new vertex clause and, and those kind of issues can be really complicated. So we've actually had, um, there's, been, there's been a really solid individual and independent contributor who actually wrote all, all the scheduling code, it was Vincent Lejeune, uh, and he's done a really good job uh, with the scheduler. Uh, so it's actually pretty solid now. But one of, the, one of the biggest issues we have with scheduling is it's really important for us to minimize the register usage. So within each compute unit, there's a single register pool. And the hardware allocates registers from this pool for each thread. So as, as I mentioned before, each thread has access to 128 registers, but there's not enough registers in that global register pool for the different threads to actually hit that maximum. So in order to have sort of optimal utilization of the compute units, we need to use a much smaller amount of registers. So really the strategy that we want is we want to be able to switch scheduling strategies once we've reached our maximum register count that, that gives us the, the best utilization of, of the compute units. So we currently have basic register pressure tracking that help us schedule the texture and vertex instructions and decide when to cut off a clause. Um, but we don't currently take advantage of the machine schedule register pre pressure tracking. So this is something that I, I've seen in the machine scheduler code. I've wanted to investigate because I, I think we could, it, we could really use it to help us 
sort of manage our register use because by default, the scheduler assumes that if you have registers, you want to use them. And that's not really the case here. We, we have hundreds of registers, but really we want to try and limit our usage of them as much as possible. Okay, so just sort of to wrap it up, some areas for future work that we're interested in. Uh, as always, we're, you know, main focus is working on support for new hardware. We come out with a new variant roughly once a year, uh, so there's sort of a lot of work uh, that goes into to adding support for the, the new hardware. Uh, also, we want full support, you know, we're also working on full support for GPU programming languages like OpenCLC, GLSL. Uh, we're in pretty good shape with GLSL. OpenCLC, even we haven't been working that quite as long, and there's obviously a lot more to that, um, so that's something that's still currently in development. Other ideas we have, we, we definitely want to get a machine scheduler implementation for our graphics core next. Um, we're also looking at possibly coming up with some sort of standardized intrinsics to use for GLSL, which we can share with other GPU backends. And I'm also really interested in the potential selection DAG replacement. Not, not really sure if that's going to happen or when it's going to happen, but that, that's something that I'd be interested in because it would really benefit us to have a little more control over the instruction selection process. Another issue that is sort of more a library issue, but I'd really like to have better error reporting from the back end because right now, if something goes wrong, you, you, like there's uh, a pattern missing and it, the instru instruction selector doesn't know how to select something, it just crashes. And this is bad if you're including LLVM as a library and something like an OpenCL driver where you kind of want to report those errors back to the user. So that would be something that we're looking for. Uh, and then as always, we want some performance improvements. Uh, we sort of want to get more GPU backends in LLVM in, in, into the main code base. I know that there's MVPTX already, but that's not really a real backend. It doesn't generate machine code. So we're really looking forward to sort of paving the way and making it easier for uh, other people to contribute their GPU backends into LLVM because I think that, that would be good for the project uh, and, and, and good for those, those other groups. Those pr pretty much wraps it up of my talk. Um, I just have a few um, resources. I'll post these slides up if, if you're interested in learning more. Uh, are there any questions for, from anyone in the audience? Yes? I'm just curious, what are you using for an assembler? Uh, yeah, can you uh, talk into the microphone because we're recording the question. What are you using for an assembler for uh, your architectures, particularly the VLIW? Uh, so we actually don't have an assembler. So. Um, like there's no way to just write the assembly code and get a program using LLVM. It's just all, you have to go through OpenCLC or GLSL or, or something like that. But that's something I would really like to, if, you know, if I had time, that's something that I am interested in doing, but I just, it's kind of low on the to-do list. So you didn't mention, you didn't mention anything about uh, legalization? How does that, is that not exist or? Um, so uh, you, you're talking about um, like, so like like how do we? Yeah. So you talked about how you had that default operand yeah. list. I would see something like I would expect to see something like that come into play in the legalizer, where you actually start setting those operands instead of only using the default. So I was um, just curious, like, are you not using it? Yeah. Or does it have a role, but you couldn't figure out a way to get it to set those operands or what? So those operands really aren't used until after the instruction selection, and they're really only used by our machine instruction passes. If, if that. Yeah, I guess it answers. Okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's mentioned in the slides that uh, the R600 backend is used for AMD's open source drivers. Yeah. So do you have plan to extend that to your production drivers? Um, so do we have plan to use the R600 backend like in our proprietary OpenCL right. drivers? Uh, that's something I don't really know. Um, my second question is that I noticed that there is an AMD IL backend in the LVM repository, but that's not touched for like a year. Yeah. So do you have plan to rebase that to the current trunk? Um, I'm not really sure. That's a completely different team, so I'm not really sure exactly what the plans are. Um, Sorry. So just following on to the question I asked about the assembler, is, is your backend going directly from uh, MI to MC and then out to object code? Are you using the MC layer at all? Yes. You are? Yeah. So did you have any problems with the VLIW aspect in the MC layer? Um, 
Not really. What we're doing is we're, we're using the uh, packetizer. Mm -hmm. So when by the time it gets to the MC layer, the instructions are already in the correct order uh, that they need to be emitted. So there's really, it, at that point, it doesn't really even matter that they're packets. They're already in the correct order and, and ready for to be emitted. OK. Thanks. Yep. So do you care about compilation time? Uh, yes, we care about compilation time. Um, it is an issue. It's something that I haven't really had time to look at at all because you know, we care more about correctness at this point. So um, definitely something on, on my to-do list. And I'm, I'm always interested in, in what other people are doing with that because that, that's a big problem. I mean, especially selection lag, you could use fast ISO pass. Yeah, th that's one thing I've considered uh, using the fast ISO. Uh, again, it, it seems like a lot of work. Uh, and I'm, it's hard without knowing ahead of time what the benef how much benefit that will give us to sort of make that commitment. But yeah, that, that's yeah, it's something that I, I've thought about doing for sure. So um, sorry, did you have to have any problems with opt? So what if opt generates like irreducible control flow, for example? Right. Um, so we have uh, there's actually two. We have two structurizer passes that will structurize the control flow. Uh, there's one that works on the L on LLVM IR, which is actually you know a standard uh, transform that's you know in, in the, the core libraries, uh, and then we have our own uh, structurizer which uh, operates on the machine instructions, which we run we can run later on. So we, we have those two passes that we we use them both right. in a lot so, of cases. So you pretty much let LLVM do its thing and then fix it when it goes wrong. Right. Exactly. Cool. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, well, let's thank Tom. Okay, thank you.